You know what's uh, would be funny is like there will be blood and no country for old men. <laughs> yeah, we should do that one. Came out I, at the same time. I'm all for it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that, that might be a long episode because there's a lot to say about both <laughs> those movies. <laughs> I was just <laughs> talking to a buddy of mine about um, uh, about those, and I was surprised that um, I was surprised that he was uh, not. Uh, he he expressed uh, a feeling of them both being fairly overrated in his mind. And I was just like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, I could I could definitely see any I, I've heard people who have problems with one or the other, but I was I was very much uh surprised, I'd say, to hear him yeah. say that. I, I know a lot of people uh came out of No Country for Old Men thinking, what the hell did I just watch? Um yeah. Oh, yeah, it was like out of nowhere. I mean, the ending was definitely smack in the face, slap in the face type of thing. Yeah, well, actually, uh, I, I would I would kind of disagree with that. I, I think that most people had a problem with the ending because they're, they felt like there was no smack in the face. They felt like it just fizzled out. And... Uh, I, you know, when I, I watched it, I was just kind of like, holy shit, he just wrapped up the entire movie in one short, elegant speech, and the character doesn't even realize that he's wrapping up the entire philosophy of the entire movie. Uh, and when I met with the people who were just, uh, you know, like when it cut to the credits, said, what the hell did I just watch? Their problem wasn't that they got slapped in their fa- in the face. Their problem was that they felt like it just kind of stopped. It just kind of fizzled out. It just kind of went away. And they, uh, they felt uh, particularly dissatisfied by it. But um, yeah. I, at least that's, yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, but for me, that that's there, and you're right. I think they misread the movie, of course. But yeah, for me, for me, the slap in the face was the the car crash. Uh, the the way it ends, it's a sequence of events that leads up to that speech in the end. Yeah. But but that car crash comes from out of nowhere, and it's got nothing to do with anything, even though it has everything to do with everything. Um, if um if you know what the what the movie is going for um but and and the speech is more of a an epilogue more than yeah. anything else um and and it makes perfect sense and and it's comparing it to there will be blood it's it's pretty similar too i would say there will be blood is less climactic in a way even though it's got that big scene with the yeah. right drink your milkshake thing uh, that's yeah. in the end, right? Yeah, that's in the yeah. end. That's in the yeah. end. Yeah, I no, that's... drink your milkshake. I drank <laughs> it out. <laughs> it was a pretty epic scene. It was a good climax, yeah. but but it was just them in a room, and then the the beating and the smashing, and then when he says, "I'm, I'm finished. finished," it's it's a similar thing to to the No Country for Old Men. It's just a very succinct. Speech. There's definitely some like uh, some uh, definite similarities, considering that they're they they really are fairly different movies. There's a lot of things that um, that seem to line up with them for sure. Yeah, it's actually kind of an interesting conversation. Like, which final line in the movie sticks out more or impacted you more? There will be I blood. have to rewatch them again. Yeah, there will be blood. I'm finished, or no country for old men. And then I woke up. Well, I think um, then uh, I woke up is is more elegant. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but in, in general, I think it's a more elegant movie. Um, no country, especially when I rewatched it. Uh, but but there will be blood is is a glorious mess. And especially the ending, yeah. uh, the, I think 
for me, of course, again, it's the milkshake scene. So it's, it's a pretty big scene and it's really yeah. well written. But the I'm finished, uh, it, it didn't rub me the right way um, the first time. But it just felt it's a, it felt a bit over the top, but it's it is the whole movie is over the top in a way, at least parts of it. Uh, but then when the music kicks in and he does the whole classical score, like the classical yeah. music over the credits, I was like, yes, no, this actually this makes perfect sense. Even though it rubs me the wrong way, it's operatic. It's 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 absurd, and it's trying to like show this life that's bigger yeah. than than life than than most lives, or at least someone who was that ambitious and, and aspired for all that and, and it's just a disgusting ending and i guess i should be disgusted so so maybe my reaction was correct <laughs> so um yeah so it's uh, there i mean i i they're very different movies but it's just that they came out at the same time and they both basically was in the oscar race and I always felt There Will Be Blood was the better movie, but on a rewatch, No Country is really just monumentally a good movie. It's definitely up there, but but There Will Be Blood is, to me, just really just took it to another level. I don't yeah. Know. Uh, it, you know, it, it's actually kind of funny. I, I was just thinking about uh, reading the American Cinematographer article. She's uh, back in uh 2007 2008 on uh on there will be blood and uh robert ellswit particularly talked about the scene where uh you know the adult hw Plainview goes to visit with uh daniel Plainview in his uh in his mansion after he's made his fortune and you know drunk the milkshake and all that stuff and made his money and it was kind of funny because uh you know paul thomas anderson is almost as anti-digital as uh tarantino is and they decided to not go with the digital intermediate and as far as I'm concerned, the lighting in that one scene, the the actual cinematography in that one scene is actually my favorite in the entire movie. And that was the specific scene that Robert Ellswit pointed out to in American Cinematographer saying that that was where he wished that he had a digital intermediate <laughs> so he could go in and fix certain things. And I. I mean, I still fail to see where he could have fixed anything in that scene. I mean, I, I, I can see where he could fix some some stuff in, you know, like the, the burning um, oil derrick sequence. You know, like there were some continuity issues there, uh, which, you know, you, can, you, you really can't blame them for that. I mean, they decided to burn down an oil derrick during magic hour. You know there there are going to be issues <laughs> with that, but um, uh, I'd have to rewatch that scene because I, I remember it very specifically, but I don't remember anything about the way it looked. Just just the conversation that the characters have. Yeah, well, I and I mean that's probably a testament to how well it was shot that you don't remember it. You know. <laughs> yes. Uh, but. Yeah, I, I mean, that, I, I haven't. I don't think I've watched the movie since we saw it in theaters. Oh, uh, um, I mean, maybe, I, maybe I saw it one other time. Maybe. Yeah, you're talking about the scene with the milkshake, like the ending. Oh. No, the one right no, before no, that, where, the, where his adopted son uh, comes back oh. and talks to him. Yeah, uh, from my recollection. I actually, I, I'm not sure if I was a huge fan of the lighting and the, and that scene. I mean, it was good. I, I don't think it stood out as as a badly lit scene, but I thought you were talking about the um the ending scene, which is actually very bare, very just sort of bowling alley. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It was very simple and harsh, and and uh, but um, but. Yeah, but that's in general. I think film gives that to you, uh, and even El- Elsbeth, I, I think, 
said that one of the issues that he has with shooting digital is that it's not as forgiving as film. Like with film, you could mess up your lighting a bit. It's still just going to naturally look really good. But with digital, if you really don't nail your lighting or at least fix it in post, it's going to show. Like it shows, it really shows. Like it, it kind of separates the um, the good ones from, from the um, from the yeah. not so good ones that rely on film to beautify their images <laughs> all those years. Yeah. Yeah. You can beat the living shit out of film, and it'll still give you something nice. You can't really do the same the same thing with digital. Uh, yeah, no, but uh, I think, but obviously, if you come up from the digital world, if you've shot most of your stuff on digital, then you're aware of that. So you tend to not use too many harsh lights, especially for um, as a key, you know, all those things that just don't work as well with digital, unless it's a very specific look that you're going for. Like, for example, I, I think a good example is... Uh, uh, American Psycho. <laughs> it's yeah. one of those movies. Yeah. The whole movie was shot, shot with harsh light, and yeah. and every time I, I watched the or my every time the one time I watched that movie is like, wow, this movie would look like shit if it was shot digitally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the only thing that salvages the look of this movie is that it was shot on film. You cannot shoot that movie digitally. It would just not work. Uh, we've seen it. It was called Dexter. <laughs> the TV show. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> Dexter had that issue. I don't know if it was all the seasons because they've had different DPs, but there was. It was definitely a terrible looking show. There was something there. They were doing like this harsh light, and I think it was the American Psycho might have been the um, the inspiration. But because it's you know it's a serial killer and it's a harsh world, harsh soul. Well, it doesn't help that with with uh, yeah. Dexter you have. Let's just assume for a moment that you're right, that they, they're like, oh, this is one of the most popular, you know, uh, movies about, uh, you know, about psycho killer people, whatever. And it's like, let's just take our inspiration from this. You've got all that harshness that you're talking about in the lighting. And on top of that, you've got a, a, a Miami color scheme. Well, I mean, yeah. especially, especially oh. with early Dexter, they didn't even get their exposure right. You know, like yeah. the yeah, it's, a lot of it's an ugly uh, show. That's sorry. <laughs> because it's going for something. It's trying to be different. Uh, a lot of shows, The Expanse would be another one. Uh, like when I watched the first season, it's kind of an ugly show, but but it was going for a similar thing. Only it did it maybe slightly better than Dexter. It was more moody. It was not as um, not as. Uh, but there's some overexposure. It was a lot of harsh lights, but it was trying to create this harsh universe. But, and it worked slightly better in sci-fi than it did in the Miami setting. So I'll give yeah. him that. But it's, it's it, you really need to be smart about when, when you go on a limb like that, especially for a show where you commit to that for season yeah. upon season. Oh, I think uh, that show gets better, too, when you get to like season four and five. The just I don't know part of it them being in different locations I guess but um, I don't know there's certain things about the expanse that got better uh, not just the look but other things too yeah uh, you know the thing is you know with uh, American Psycho uh, the the cinematographer on that film was Andres Sekula who also shot uh, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction um, mm. uh, and uh, uh, geez, he also shot that um, horror movie with Luke Wilson and Kate Beckinsale. Uh, um, uh, no vacancy uh, or something like that. Uh, oh yeah, no, just vacancy. Vacancy. Um, yeah. yeah, and you know, like his whole shtick is shooting the slowest possible film all the time. Like he he is really devoted to i i mean like even when he was shooting vacancy in his american cinematographer article he was just saying that they were testing the 500 iso vision 2 stocks i think at the time and no resolution's not there too grainy not gonna do it and 
I mean, I think he did a pretty good job with vacancy. Uh, I, I mean, the movie is not particularly good, but you know, I, 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 I think that his work on that was pretty good, but I mean, you can kind of see how his work has kind of suffered, you know, at least from my perspective, uh, you know, over time in that he is so devoted to having the, these grainless images that he just decides to use hard lighting rather than, uh, and slower film rather than diffusing the light and just, and just using faster film. Hmm. He also shot, um, that movie that, uh, that Ross Geller from friends made, um, trust, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was shot digitally and that's actually kind of the perfect illustrative example is that it was shot digitally with that same hard lighting aesthetic. And that just did not work for me at all. Uh, I, I mean, that was not Pulp Fiction, (laughs) you know, (laughs) Pulp Fiction was shot 90%, I think with 50 ISO stock. And I don't think it really looked like that. I don't think it was, I don't think it looked overlit uh, or that he was struggling all that much. But uh, yeah, with trust, that was where it was kind of like, okay, you know, this is digital now. And I'm looking at an undiffused open face 2K lighting a person's face. And uh <laughs> 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 so yeah, yeah no, I, I'm looking at it now I'm looking at the trailer and it's just it looks like a lesser version of uh, American Psycho yeah what, was it digital what camera was that on uh I, I don't recall uh that that was too many years ago <laughs> um it's not horrible I mean obviously he's a he's an established DP so it's it's gonna look better than if we attempt to pull that off but it's yeah. um, but it's it is funny. I I feel like and this is where I was gonna switch the subject a bit. Uh, it's that sometimes there are DPs that commit to a certain style, and they don't adapt too much with the story. They they adapt somewhat, but they they're kind of are stuck in their ways about certain ways of doing things. Um, it's it's actually shot on film. Oh, it was. Yeah, I guess it oh, just looked crap. bad. As, uh, you know, uh, it's just Panavision, Panaflex, Gold, Millennium. Um, yeah, Super 30. Oh, well, I stand corrected. That's why I was, I was looking at it and I was like, that looks like a very good digital camera. Like, it still looked worse than American Psycho, but it, but it, it looked like wow. a very good digital camera. And it's 2010. And I'm like, the Alexa? When did the Alexa come out? Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah the, well, I stand corrected. Um, and... Uh, that that's I think the first movie that I've ever mistaken as digital that was shot on film. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, good for him. Uh, well, bad for I I don't know. Well, uh, good on good on David good on David Schwimmer for shooting on film. Uh, <laughs> well, it's 2010. I mean, when did I think it really kicked in? Uh, I guess 2010. I was already like in full swing the whole digital. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure and, we can by, make and by the way, that's not a bad movie I, either. I mean, it's uh, it, I mean, it's not a great movie, but um, uh, it, it's uh, you know, if you're, it, it, you know, if you're struggling to think of a movie to watch for two hours, Trust is pretty good, and uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of weird that Clive Owen flew under the radar the way that he did. <laughs> I mean. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So I, I was gonna say um, a, a very odd example to bring up for like DPs that are are set in their ways is in many ways I feel I feel like Roger Deakins is pretty set in his ways, uh, even though he's amazing and and it's just it only proves how easily he transitioned from film to digital because he's so good at what he does and it's so understated and it's so good looking. 
but he has this thing of he always just gets this very sharp good glass to get the clearest image and he doesn't mess around too much with the digital image like with the LUTs and all that he doesn't go crazy uh, I think he went a little bit be- with the 2049 because it was science fiction that's why he won I guess the Academy Award because he really went all out for that movie yeah but, but it still wasn't dirty it was clean it was a very clean image it wasn't trying to be the, the original Blade Runner especially if you just can't reproduce that dirtiness with digital so yeah there's something about his image is always pristine always clean and it looks good but it doesn't have he doesn't vary as much in his character like he's consistent but he's um but there's not a huge difference between his movies he's just got a look that's his look it's very natural and at the same time can be very dramatic depending on the moment the scene the movie um he uses colors really well when he needs to but but i uh, and it's more from his podcast too i'm listening to he talks to all these dps and especially younger ones that are all into using different lenses different LUTs, like all, all these different ways especially with the digital cameras to get a, a different look for each project and adding grain you don't see a lot of grain like he doesn't yeah. play with adding grain into his digital image he just doesn't mess with that stuff it's like i want a clean clear image and it works for me because i'm the shit. Like because it just looks that good. Uh, other people just need to beautify their images in other ways, not because they're hiding their work, but they're, because they're trying to shape the look to the movie. Um, so yeah. so yeah, and and I feel like in a way it limits him. Like you're not gonna see him go off well, and, and do something. I mean, I hope, yeah, but he's maybe too old to, to do that. But maybe he'll prove me wrong. Well, but, I mean. I, 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 I'm not going to get the quote entirely right, but I think Orson Welles said that uh, something along the lines of the enemy of creativity is a lack of restrictions. And, and you know, Roger Deakins talks about this too in terms of um, uh, using primes rather than zooms. Because when you use a prime, you have to actually pip up, pick up the damn camera, move it, frame your shot and be really deliberate with everything that you're doing and with zoom it allows you to kind of get lazy and just be like okay well we just shot the over the shoulder let's just zoom in and and get the close-up and not move the camera and it it, you know without that precision it, it without that constraint that you're placing on yourself by using a fixed focal length lens you're kind of screwing yourself (laughs) because you're not really examining it. You're allowing yourself to get lazy (laughs) the moment that you do that. And I think that's, you know, a a component to the brilliance of Roger Deakins. Uh, But, you know, like in contrast, you think about somebody like uh, Emmanuel Lebesky, who, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, he, mostly he's he's shooting on the Alexa himself, but, you know, he still uses film every so often. He still uh, uh, plays around uh, with a bunch of different stuff. And I, I actually think that uh, Lubezki made a really cogent point at one point where he just said... Uh, Shooting digital is like looking at a movie through a window and shooting film is like observing a movie on a canvas. Hmm. But again, like if you can, if you can control the window as well as Roger Deakins, I mean, Roger Deakins is better on an iPhone than I am with an IMAX camera. If I ever got, if I ever got to touch one. (laughs) Yeah. And Lubezki um, too. For that matter, yeah. that's why they do so well. And, and then other ones, just uh, like I said, they come up in the digital world. So there's a lot of uh, trial and error to know yeah. what works and what doesn't work with the digital image. But um, but yeah, mostly I was gonna say it's just that 1917, for example. I just felt like it could have been dirtier. It just was too clean for me. Everything was way too clean about that movie. Um, even potentially the the movement slightly at times, or, or it was too shaky at times <laughs> when it was supposed to be steady. 
Um, I mean, it was a nice accomplishment, and there were some gorgeous scenes there, especially the nighttime scenes that he actually lit. Yeah. But um, but it was too clean. Like it, it almost should have been shot on film, but obviously logistically it wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. But but dirtying up the image, maybe getting some filters on the um, the, or, or at least adding some grain, something that that just would have made it more World War One. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's mainly you know what I felt like, and maybe it's with a different DP that would have happened. And not to say that it's the right thing to do. It's just that I, when I watched that movie, I felt like that's what I, what I feel about now is either you're gonna dirty up the image a little bit for um, a movie set in the past, or you just shoot it on film. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's choices, and obviously he's still very good at what he does. He's one of the best. Obviously, it's just limitations. But but if you're still one of the best, then there's no complaints. It's 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 fine to be set in your ways.